theme. Like for a while there, it was uh, the Star Trek cartoon from the 1970s. I just showed still with the map. And then they part with Harvey Birdman. I don't know what I'm going to do next. I think it's going to be Looney Tunes. So with that, we get to, we get to John Brown, right? Yeah. And that's in Kansas. And what else did we do yesterday? Are we recording? We're recording, people. So when is the DBQ? Do you want to quiz them all? Eight questions? Ten questions? It helps to do a quiz. It would be easier for me not to give a quiz, right? Let's do what's easy. Huh? You can use the book up to the very moment you get the quiz. You're welcome. So with that, we'll be selfless and we'll do what's easy. Wow, that's so nice of you. All right. So, um, oh, who was elected president in 1854? 52, I'm sorry. He was a dough face. Pierce. Pierce. A dough face means he's a northern what party? Democrat. Democrat supports slavery and stuff. And we got the wait. Uh, oh, who broke up the Compromise of 1850 to get a pass? Douglas, yep, the little giant of Illinois. And he also wanted a what? A northern route for what? Railroad. <laughs> and what law would that lead to? Kansas, Nebraska, and where would that lead to Civil War? What state? Kansas. Who were the people who supported free soil? What were they called? Jayhawkers. What were the people who supported slavery called? And the sack of what city? Lawrence. Is that what we quit? We got to. Oh, what do you call those pirates? They're essentially just thugs who tried to overthrow Latin American governments. Yeah, filibusters. And what said, what manifesto said the U.S. should get Cuba for two slave states? Austin. So let's move. We got this. We got this. Did we get to anything, John Brown? We got this, and that's my yearbook photo. Yeah, we did that. Got this. Oh my God, I had a dream about that picture last night. Did we mention Potawatomi Brown? I don't think we got here. I think this is where we quit, wasn't it? I oh, okay. So let's quick get this in. So he went out. Oh, um, who beat Sumner on the floor of the United States Senate? Oh, yeah, Preston Bully Brooks. And this shows, I mean, this, to many Northerners, we're going to have to start fighting back. It's no coincidence. Right after Preston Brooks beat Sumner, right after Lawrence, Brown decided, I have to act. We can no longer be bullied. If they're going to use violence, we're going to use violence. He thought he was fighting people who sacked Lawrence. They could have been part of that sack. But Brown, thinking we must fight back, and he believed there was a massacre, came up to five homesteads of pro-slavery people along Pottawatomie Creek. Along Pottawatomie Creek. Oh, we got to, we butchered them with broadswords. Did we get to that? Yes. Did we get to Osawatomie? What's happened at Osawatomie? So, Pottawatomie Brown became what Southerners said, look at this bloodthirsty pro-slavery people. This proves everything we need to know. Abolitionists don't want freedom. They want to kill us in the middle of the night. And Pottawatomie Brown became the greatest fear of the South. All three soilers, no, no. Know what they are really? Pottawatomie Brown. Yet at Osawatomie, yes, I'm not making that up, John Brown and a few others beat off border ruffians, saving a free soil wagon train, essentially. And by winning an Osawatomie, Osawatomie Brown became the fighter against pro-slavery thugs. So Osawatomie Brown was a hero to free soilers. Potawatomie Brown was the fear of all the slaveholders, just depending on what side you're on. If you want to emphasize what happened at Potawatomi, that's what Southerners would say. Osawatomi, free soilers. So John Brown really showed the complexities of this horrible 
civil war that was happening in Kansas. I should have, that's what civil wars are. That's what guerrilla fighting is. Yes, it's murder. But that's what it is. So John Brown killed pro-slavery people. And then and then pro-slavery people in the South started calling him Potawatomi Brown as this bloodthirsty murderer. Free soilers, Osawatomi Brown, the defender of freedom. Doesn't it really depend on what side you're on? One person's terrorist could be someone else's freedom fighter. It really depends on what side you're on. And they're all using terror. So they got to pick a constitution. The same year, the constitutions were written. Two competing constitutions. Two competing constitutions. Now, state flags are brand new. See, these are also proposals for the state flags of the new state of Kansas under the new constitution. So they're going to have an election. Now, I'm not sure. I'm going to let you guess. Which one of these constitutions, based upon their flag, would be the pro-slavery one? And which one would be the free soil one? It's not very clear. If you look at the flag, you know, the way that the, the lineage are, maybe the parallel lines, you can figure out which one is the pro-slavery one. Look for subtle hints in the flags. I, I doubt it. Yeah. So we have a vote. The pro-slavery versus free soil. There were more free soilers, but Franklin Pierce is a dolphins, and he came out publicly for which constitution? LeCompton. And when Pierce came out for LeCompton, a lot of free soilers said this election is going to be illegitimate, and they boycotted the election. Free soilers boycotted, border ruffians crossed the border. Now they're trying to show how this election is illegitimate. But this pretty much guaranteed the outcome, which constitution won? If free soilers boycotted, who won? Lecompton. And Pierce said that would be the constitution. Northerners went nuts and demanded another election. So arguably the boycott in this case worked. They had another election, and this time border ruffians couldn't make the trip. To a people one handle there were significantly more free soilers yes oh they have a question oh, <laughs> significantly more but this fight would rage on for another four years until they would finally become a state and the civil war would last until 1865. we have to move on a little bit but in 1860 oops i thought i typed that in imagine i typed in 1860. 1860, Kansas would be admitted as a free soil state under the Topeka Constitution. But the fighting did not end. I love the admit me free. And I don't know. So this fight would go on. And so you have this underlying then blow up about popular sovereignty, showing it was always a scam. So here's a very famous cartoon. Let's look at this for just a second. So reading the bottom. Now, remember the awkward ways they would make cartoons. But it's essentially, forcing slavery down to vote of a free soiler. Now, you have to look for a couple things about this. First off, holding the head back, forcing slavery down the throat, murder, help, neighbors, help, oh, my poor wife and children. Okay. So here's the key thing to look for. You see the table, the Democratic platform, which was pro Lecompton. And then it has Kansas, and you notice Cuba and Central America for the filibusters and the Austin Manifesto. And because the Democrats wanted to bring those in too for more slavery. And who are these? Democratic politicians. Like the most famous are Buchanan, that's Pierce, that's Stephen Douglas. So what party is this supporting? What brand new party? This is Republican, yes. So, the Republican Party. Also, out of the wake 
of the Kansas Nebraska. Remember, I told you everything is different after Kansas Nebraska. The country we know today will be created after Kansas Nebraska. The country before this is gone, except for the name and a few things. You know, Pennsylvania is still here. But who made up the Republican Party? Oh, I should have. Before you write anything down, what party disappeared? We just blew up. Gone. Free style Democrats probably made up the bulk of the party. It was not the Whigs became the Republicans. That's a pretty common myth. Abolitionists, a small percentage of the northern population, where else are they going to go? The free soil Republican Party is as close as they're going to get. And then there were some Whigs. Conscience Whigs were the term given to essentially free soil Whigs. They were opposed to slavery. Some conscious Whigs were abolitionists. And also, the really pro-business Whigs, some joined the Republican Party. Some joined the Democrats. So the old political order is literally blown up. But the bulk of the early Democrats, were, or the early Republicans were probably free all Democrats. Just like the bulk of the new Democratic Party they saw themselves as the true uh, Republican Party of Jefferson, and we have to leave because we've abandoned that. You have the same element here. Many for yourself, Democrats are saying they've abandoned us by being now the party of big plantation owners who will become Republicans. Eventually, the industrial leagues and the pro-business wing would take over the Republican Party in the 1870s. That's coming. It's not yet. So with that, Oh, one more thing. Here's a cartoon of the elephant. That's Thomas Nast's cartoon, the same one who did the cartoon about Santa Claus. This is after the Civil War, crushing the Democratic machine of New York right here. The secessionist Democrats are the pro-union Republicans, like an elephant crushing the opposition. So the Republicans would adopt it after that cartoon. Just like the Democrats would adopt the donkey, uh, after a political cartoon to try to mock the Democrats uh, 30 years ago. So that's where the term comes from. So with that, the Republican ideology would soon become this kind of ideology of the North. The view of many Northerners, including many Democrats. There's still a lot of Democrats. There's significantly more Democrats than Republicans. But a lot did leave. So this is the northern ideology, the strongly held beliefs. And what did it come? Think about southern views, and now look at the northern view. Our system is better because more and more they contemplate this idea of free labor. Remember, free labor was this idea that capitalism has created this dynamic system where workers can have their choice of jobs. So this, the early Republican ideology was free labor meant workers have all these rights. If you don't like your job, you can quit. If you don't like your job, you can demand better conditions. If you don't like your job, you can start your own business. Now, we know life is more complex than that, but this is in contrast to the South, where it's very stratified and you're stuck in your lot in life, competing against slaves. And what they emphasized here is this dynamic system of capitalism has opportunity. You can do anything you want and you're rewarded if you show initiative. And they really push this idea, if you have creativity, you work hard, you can move ahead. Now we've already talked about there's complexities with the wage system and life isn't quite like this. But we're talking now this idealized version. This is the world of Abraham Lincoln, where workers have power and they can demand higher wages if they want. That was already changing though because of the wage system. But anyways, the view. And therefore, what about the South? Competing with slaves, the stratified system, the South stifles opportunity. Why would anybody want to spread the system of slavery? Why would anybody move to the South? That's why all the immigrants moved to the North. And therefore, we're free soil. Remember the issue that led to civil war was slavery in the territories. Don't we want to push this system? 
Now, I got to be very clear about it. This was the Republican ideolo ideology. It was an idealized vision. There's going to be a horrific economic disaster, hard to even comprehend, called the Panic of 1873. And that will kind of blow this up. Just one of those things, it almost led to Civil War again. It was so bad. But that's coming. That's another fun thing for right for Christmas break. So with that, the New Republican Party. And they're vying to be one of the two parties. Don't forget, we're kind of stuck with two parties with a winner take all. The Democrats are still there, even though the Democrats are in real trouble. There might be another party vying for that we'll get to. But obviously this one may have. The other thing is, this will be opposite to that Southern ideology of the positive group. And we've talked about this, that slaves like slavery, it's in the Bible, it's economically working, so why would you want to destroy it? And also, all free soilers are really abolitionists who want to cut a throat in the middle of the night. All free soilers are really what person? Pottawatomie Brown. Yeah, John Brown. So, here we have the two views. And the problem with ideology once you decide you believe it, it becomes true to you. Now, saying that, you might think, oh, of course, yeah. No. It becomes true to you. And you're not going to listen to any evidence of the contrary. Or you might think if, if somebody believes something different, there's something wrong with them. Maybe they're traitors. So with that, the 1856 election, whew, it's the biggie. This is huge. Two new parties vying to be it. One's a Republican. The Democrats still the established party, but the Democrats are no, more and more from what section? Yeah, they're becoming more and more a Southern party, therefore, by definition, more pro-slavery. The Free Soilers that made up the majority of Northern Democrats are moving to another party. The Democratic nominee would be another doe face. James Buck Buchanan of Pennsylvania. Now, I know what a lot of you are thinking. Wait a minute, Buck Buchanan? Wasn't he the Hall of Fame defensive tackle for the Chiefs? Here he is in Super Bowl IV. That's Buck Buchanan right there. Made the Hall of Fame, one of my favorite all-time football players. I mean, look at him. They lined him up over the center. Who remembers Super Bowl IV from 1970? Am I the only one who remembers that game? Don't bog yourself down with details. Huh? 40, I can't remember. Time flies. So with that, that's Buck Buchanan. I prefer, for lots of reasons, that Buck Buchanan. But we got to go with him. And by the way, I know some of you are going to be jealous or you're going to swoon, but he was the most eligible bachelor in America. Yeah. Yeah, I shouldn't have said anything, right? So we're like, oh, if I can only be like that, I'd be like, oh, look at So with that, I know that picture is not, not the best. He's trying to do this and keep still. Well, what's his? Popular sovereignty in LeCompton. Popular sovereignty, LeCompton. Another party is going to jump into the fray. We've mentioned them before, but know nothing. And they're going to pull out a retread. Millard Fillmore. Sheet music was just becoming a big deal because cheaper printing techniques. So here's a sheet music of the Know Nothing song. The Know Nothing polka dedicated to everybody by nobody. And I know what you're thinking. They had polkas back then? Yeah. I know all of you are into polkas now. That's like the hip, cool music that everyone's listening to today. But... By the way, the song, I looked at the actual music, the words, it's worse than you think. The American party was, what is the term for anti-immigrant? They were the anti-immigrant party. So here, Millard Fillmore. Remember, his guy was president during the Compromise of 1850? Huh? He ran again, yeah. Of course you can, come on. Sure. As many times as you want back then. 
Nativists are anti-immigrant. So here's a nativist cartoon. By the way, the 1856, it makes sense. Southern Germans and what colony of Britain suffered greatly in the 1840s as a million immigrants came over? Ireland. And what religion? So a lot of it was anti-Catholic bias. So here's a cartoon showing the Pope at top of St. Peter's, and there they are eyeing the invasion of the United States with immigrants. There's people who think that today about immigrants in the United States. So this is not a new idea. And they're a northern and southern party. And they're vying to be that second party. And then, of course, the Republicans. This brand new party, and the Republican Party is only in the north. The Republican Party is not in any state that has slavery except Delaware. And they're weak there. There's the Republican. And they tried for a war hero. The Pathfinder, the man who helped with the California uh, Rebellion back in 1848, 46, I'm sorry. Who's that? John C. Fremont. And Fremont, John Charles was a popular name. Fremont was not run for elected office, but they tried to do the war hero thing for this new party. And his slogan personifies all you need to know about Fremont. Are you ready for the slogan? Free soil, free labor, free speech, free mind. Sorry. <laughs> and so that's John C. Fremont, John Charles. By the way, Calhoun was John Caldwell. And who's Calhoun's brother? Uh, Raul. When the election came out, Buchanan won. Buchanan was elected president. And the American Party, the Know Nothings, did really well, but not well enough. They got a lot of votes, mostly in this area here. They won Maryland, but not enough. Look how well the Republicans. This brand new party only on the ballot in the North. And look how, well, sure they didn't win the popular vote, but the Democratic Party was established North and South. And look at the Electoral College. Who was very disturbed about this election? Southern Democrats, but all Democrats, exactly right. All Democrats, but especially South, because it's being dominated by the South. And they panicked. What might happen in the next election? What might happen in the next election? We are getting weaker. To the Southerners, they see this as a major sign of weakness. Even though they got a dough face to become president, a Northerner, they're panicking. I mean, just absolute panic. If they're getting weaker, what might happen in 1860? Might they get a free soil Republican? And if that happens, who knows? So for the next four years, you have seven Democrats thinking we might have no choice but to do what? We're coming to secede, but their idea would be like to strike first, which means to see. Because if we wait 10 years, we'll be too weak. So you're getting this feeling we need a preventative strike, secession. They're already thinking it. Everybody's talking civil war. So they got their man, but they're panicking. Boy, did they get a weak weak president. If they thought Pierce was bad, Buchanan. Things would start, oh, should have, what happened to the American Party? They died away. And Northern know-nothings, almost all of them became Republicans. And Southern know-nothings became Democrats. Make sense? Third parties just don't survive here. By the way, Germany's new tra um, chancellor is, is taking office right now. They're prime minister, and they don't have the same system the United States have. They have proportional legislature. So they're actually, he's representing three parties there. They have to have a coalition of three parties. Unlike here, where we have winner take all. There's good elements about both. Because if you have three parties, all it takes for him to be, his government to collapse out of new election. One party, it's going to be this party called the Free Democrats, are going to say, see ya, and then you have to have a new election. We don't have that issue here. That's good and bad. Like everything else in this world, right?
So with that, oh, let's have a little court case. No big deal. Just Dred Scott. And Dred Scott and his wife Harriet, they were slaves. Their master went up to a free state, actually free territory first, Wisconsin, and then Illinois. If they lived there for over half their life, and then when their owner died, he left them to his sister. And some abolitionists funded a lawsuit saying they should be free. They spent most of their life in free states. Now, what made them free? The Northwest Ordinance said no slave codes in these territories. So they're called free states, but it's really not quite the way you think. It's not like slavery wasn't banned per se. It's just no slave codes. But are they free? And this is going to be taken up by the Supreme Court. Justice Roger Tyne. By the way, don't you love the picture of Tiny? I'm just going to say, doesn't he look like he's in extreme pain? <laughs> Don't get everyone's like, just try not to move. He looked at it and said, you know the problem? Sectionalism. We have free states and slave states. And that's what's going to cause civil war. This is a little, little like Zachary Taylor saying, let's just make him states, and we'll solve the problem of slavery in the territories. <laughs> if we didn't have this sectional divide over slavery, there'd be no civil war. And so Roger Todd is really thinking if I could get the Supreme Court, which would be seven to two, the Supreme Court. They finally decided on nine members of the Supreme Court about 20 years before this. If we can just get rid of the sectional issue, no civil war. He'll be a hero. He was a slave owner from Maryland. Todd, but very loyal to the Union. He was appointed by uh, Andrew Jackson. Let's review. What is the term for when the Supreme Court can decide the constitutionality of laws? Yes. So we're talking judicial review. This is this in the Constitution? No. no, it is not in the Constitution. The Supreme Court gave themselves this unbelievable power, which is all kind of accepted now. It's kind of mind-boggling to me. They're not elected. So we claim to be a democratic republic. It's a little bit mind-boggling. What court case? 1803. You have to know this court case. M versus M. Did that help when I said M versus M? Yeah. Marbury versus Madison. Isn't it amazing how, that's why, remember I, I want you to do, think about brainstorm lists and we're going to do more? They really do work. Sometimes you just got to have something trigger a memory. Because it's in there in the deep, dark, and sometimes frightening recesses of your mind. It's there, probably. Once you say Barbara versus Madison, Barbara versus Madison, did everybody remember that? Oh yeah, I remember. No, you're not gonna have instant recall of it. Of course not. Well, some of you might. That one person with a photographic memory. <laughs> Who everyone else hates, right? Let's be honest. Uh, but it helps doing that. Let's come back to this. He's going to do judicial review. And this one is going to be huge. And this still isn't accepted. The first ruling they made is, you know, blacks aren't citizens. They can't sue. Regardless, free or slave can't sue. Now, this is when they should have thrown it out. But so Tani's basically saying only white people are citizens. There's no precedent to this. It was not clear at all what a citizen was. In fact, it would not be clear constitutionally until 1867 after the Civil War and the 14th Amendment. So there's no precedent. He, they just decided. No citizenship. But they kept ruling. They can't sue, but we're going to rule anyways. Slaves are property. In fact, they made the distinction. You, if you bring your livestock across state borders, if you bring your cow across state borders, it's still your cow. So if you bring your slave, it's still your slave. By the way, to me that sounds just horrific. And I meant it to be that way. I meant it. That's the, the def, that is the example they use. Therefore, any law that bans slavery in the territories are unconstitutional. Therefore, the Missouri Compromise and the Northwest Ordinances are actually unconstitutional. 
They are unconstitutional. The North is open to slavery. Not a small, not a very big ruling, is it? This won't change much. Not a big deal at all. I should ask, it does not apply to states that came into the Union before the Constitution. So it doesn't apply to these states, except for Vermont. Because they already had state constitutions before the Northwest Ordinance. Big run. So we thought, there's no distinction anymore, problem solved, right? Who is furious? Especially Republicans. And what a Republican said, we told you all along they're going to take away your rights. They're going to make you have slaves. Republicans literally said, told you so. Told you they're going to do this. That's what they are. Those are the same people that beat Charles Sumner on the floor of the Senate. They will murder you to force you to have slaves. Told you so. Doesn't this remind you of the Patriots doing the same thing about the British? Told you so. And then what did Southerners do when Republicans said this? They're going to kill us in the middle of the night. They won't even follow the law. Told you so. By the way, haven't we kind of devolved now into fourth graders fighting? Told you they're going to be evil and not follow law so they have a slave rebellion and take away everything you own. Told you so. Yes. And Southerners, by saying Republicans are opposed to this, they're saying, see, they won't even follow the law. They're going to get rid of the slaves. They're a bunch of John Browns. How did they think that they were going to be forced to have slaves, though? Or is this just like trying to make it a bigger deal? Just like uh, back in 1774, when Patriot, or Patriots said that Brit, Brit, the British are going to force everyone to become Catholic. It's to make everyone scared. It's demagoguery. Oh, okay. But... Technically, it says uh, you can't ban slavery. So, so with that, oh, then let's have an economic panic. Not a big deal. Nothing to see here. Move on. And what happened was it started with railroad stocks and other things. And I'll tell you more about this after Christmas, about how panic starts. But it, all of a sudden, people are buying less fabric. What happens to the price of cotton? Cotton prices tumbled. Can you imagine how, how even more insecure they were in the South then? They, may, they spent all that money for land and slaves and the prices dropped. So here's one of my favorite pictures of the Panic of 1857. And it's supposed to show the panic outside Wall Street. You know, pieces of paper saying, this used to be worth money. So they're all panicking. But I like this picture for lots of reasons. I think, can, can you see it? The guy in the carriage doesn't look like he's fishing for hats. Got one. All right, so with that, I know it has nothing to do with anything. I just enjoy that picture. So the next year, a relatively unknown politician was challenging a giant, Stephen Douglas, for the Senate in Illinois. And this made news, the Lincoln-Douglas debates. That's why Lincoln was a Republican, Douglas was the Democrat. Now, Douglas was by far the most prominent. And the biggest issue was the Dred Scott decision. And Lincoln came out totally opposed to Dred Scott. Douglas had to straddle the fence. I'll explain that more in a second. But people did not vote for Senate back then. That would not change until 1913 in the 17th Amendment, which we'll get to. State Assembly, this is actually a vote for the State Assembly. They're having a debate in seven Illinois cities to try to encourage them to vote for either Republicans or Democrats in the state assembly. And by the way, must we try to contrast Douglas was about 5'5 five five and Lincoln was about 6'4. So it must have been a very big contrast on the stage. No, Lincoln did not wear a white suit probably, but you know, we couldn't tell who it was. And I like how they have signs and all that. No, it did not look like this. I just put this picture on. And it was not like a modern debate. Like if you watch the presidential debates in 2020, they get kind of lame questions and then they'll, they'll spew off talking points for two minutes and say nothing. They're aggravating and frustrating. 
and usually in between beating a rock. Debates, to, debates them set amount of time, not only they ask questions, but they ask questions to each other. And the expectation is people went there not to try to score a cheap uh, gotcha thing, gotcha response, but to hear what they have to say. I'm being a little bit idealistic, but it was just different. And it is where Lincoln saying in Alton, Illinois, about the Dred Scott decision. Dred Scott decision proves one thing. The country can no longer remain forever half slave or half free. A house divided against itself cannot stand. We will either be all slavery or all free. So just that he's, he's predicting this. Meaning, what? <laughs> Dred Scott's going to try to make us all slave. Are we going to allow that? He's kind of implying we have a short time until that will be imposed, a.k.a. law. So he's worried. He also makes the great comment, are we going to a country that stands for liberty and let people decide? Or are we going to be a desk or are we going to force everyone to have slaves and become a despotism? And if we're going to become a, a despotic state, I'll move to Russia and be under the czar. At least we don't lie about it and claim to be a democracy. Douglas was in a bind. Douglas wanted to be president. And so in Freeport, Illinois, in the north, much more uh, anti-slavery in northern Illinois, he would make a statement that's going to be dubbed the Freeport Doctrine, Freeport Doctrine which is kind of a statement of his views. And what he said was, hey, Dred Scott's the law, but states and territories, they don't have to have slave codes. And if you don't have slave codes, you don't have to have slavery. Now, he's technically right. Nobody is going to bring slaves into an area that doesn't have slave codes. Just, it's not going to happen. So that kind of fits in with, you know, really, do they really believe that slaves? No, they're scaring people. But. He's trying to straddle the fence. Don't you like that picture of Douglas there? Almost looks like a little kid. <laughs> like, he, like he just did something wrong. They don't have to pass slave codes. He's trying to appeal to the South by saying, I agree with Dred Scott, and trying to appeal to the North by saying, you don't have to have slaves. Who did this appeal to? Nobody, especially Southerners. Southerners are not going to forget this. They didn't want this statement. They wanted Douglas to say, I want slavery everywhere. They will remember in 1860 when Douglas tried to get the nomination. So that is the free port doctrine. Who's going to win the, the senator? Douglas will win easily. won't even be close. Lincoln? Lincoln is still relatively unknown, even though he got the attention of a few Republicans with this. And that can mean only one thing. We're back to him. John Brown. So John Brown would still fight in Kansas, be run out by federal forces because he's wanted for murder from Pottawatomie Creek. He would go to the burnt over region of New York and look for allies, including Frederick Douglass, of abolitionists. And he had an idea. We can't sit back anymore. We have to fight evil, slavery. And that's going to lead to John Brown Ray. Harper's Ferry, Virginia, 1859. So, he tried to convince people, Northerners, and many were tired of the bullying of the South. The federal government's not going to do anything, especially with a dull face as president. So we're going to have to fight ourselves. And if you're going to end slavery, you've got to fight. So his plan was to go south, attack the, ar the arsenal, the armory at Harper's Ferry, where they made weapons, muskets, and start a slave rebellion. They're going to use those muskets, and they brought down pipes to arm slaves the thought was they could go to the Appalachian Mountains, race up and down the mountains, and trigger a rebellion. 
we don't know if you really meant this. Can you imagine anything that would terrify people more than a slave rebellion? Or did was he trying to literally get caught? And what do you call somebody who dies for their cause? A martyr. I'm leaning towards that, but I don't know. He's risking something. And there's very few plantations around Harpers Ferry. We do this very few slaves. Harpers Ferry is in the mountains. It's, this is the poster of it. It's one of the most beautiful places I've ever been to, where the Shenandoah runs into the Potomac. It's got um, three different mountain valleys coming together. It's beautiful. It's still, and they have the town run by the Park Service like it's still 1859. It still looks like that. It's it's really cool. Yeah. In his ideal world, well, I think he said he wanted both races. Yes. He wanted both races to be equal. He, um, yeah, and so you're going to get people out the back saying he was a crazy self. He, he a little bit. Uh, that's me. <laughs> but. But it was a way to discredit abolitionism by saying he was just a, a religious zealot and murderer. So they attacked. It did not go well. He hesitated, stayed in Harper's Ferry, and stayed in the fire station right here and didn't leave it. Nobody joined the rebellion. We will finish this tomorrow, right after we talk about the DBQ. They did the election of 1860 and secession. And then on Friday, we're going to watch, make sure you have a that video. I left Friday open because I wasn't sure we'd do DBQ, but we're going to watch that second part of the con. We're going to watch the first part, we'll watch part two, which is the Battle of Bull Run. Thank you. See you tomorrow. I know what you're thinking. Shall we, Memo? Thank <laughs> you.